This is What Happens When We Die, Part 7. Now we come to 1 Samuel chapter 28 and the story of the witch at Endor and the calling up of Samuel to speak with Saul, King Saul at the time. Up front I'm going to say that this story seems to be a little unclear as to exactly what transpired and therefore it is capable of being interpreted more than one way. However, as I have said beforehand, when we find something in the scriptures that seems to go against the weight of scriptures, what the rest of the Bible is saying, we are not meant to reinterpret the rest of scripture to fall into line with that one verse, passage or story. Instead, we should be seeking the Lord for understanding as to how this unusual verse, passage or story fits in with the weight of scripture. And that would be what Paul said to Timothy, rightly dividing the word of truth. The most common view in this story is that the ghost, spirit or soul of Samuel made an appearance in this chapter. And so based on this, it is used as a, another proof text that the soul lives on after the body dies. We have already established that this does not happen. So now we need to take a close look at this chapter and see if there is any change to the established order of the scriptures. Before we go to 1 Samuel chapter 28, let's read 1 Samuel chapter 25 verse 1 which says, Samuel died. And that's straightforward. We have previously established what happens when you die. Your spirit goes back to God who gave it. The body goes to the ground and there is no separate soul to deal with because a soul is a living person. Now we come to 1 Samuel chapter 28 and we will cover off the basic story here, picking it up in verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that the Philistines gathered their armies together for warfare to fight with Israel. In verse 3 we again are told now Samuel was dead. Verse 3 also gives us this interesting information which is relevant to the story. And Saul had put away those that had familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. We go to verse 5. And when Saul, Saul saw the host of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart greatly trembled. And when Saul, in verse 6, and when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams nor by Urim, nor by prophets. Now I, I want to comment on this before I proceed. Coming back to verse 3, it tells us that Saul had put away those that had familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. From Easton's Bible Dictionary, we learn that a person who has a familiar spirit is a sorcerer or a necromancer, that is someone who is said to be able to communicate with the dead and reanimate them. And it is most likely that such a person with a familiar spirit would be possessed of a devil. Still reading further, it says, Such a person was called by the Hebrews an ob, which properly means a leathern bottle, for sorcerers were regarded as vessels containing the inspiring demon. From Strong's definitions concerning this word ob, carrying the idea of a prattling of prattling a father's name, properly a mumble, that is a water skin from its hollow sound. So we get this uh, empty leathern bottle idea again. Hence a necromancer, ventriloquist, as from a jar, bottle, familiar spirit. So it's interesting also that Strong's brings in the idea of a ventriloquist, somebody who is able to project their voice. Strong's definition of a familiar spirit includes a mutter and a ventriloquist. In Isaiah 8 verse 19 we read, And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their God for the living to the dead? From Barnes's notes on the Bible concerning this verse and familiar spirits we read, the Septuagint renders the place thus, And if they say to you, Seek the ventriloquists, and those speaking from the earth, and speaking vain things who speak from the belly. From this it is evident that the art of the ventriloquist, so well now known, 
was known then, and it is highly probable that the secret of the art of soothsayers consisted very much in being able to throw the voice with various modifications into different places so that it would seem to come from a grave or from an image of a dead person that was made to appear at the proper time. Now, this is all very interesting and its relevance will become clearer as we, as we proceed further into 1 Samuel chapter 28. From Jesenius's Hebrew Chaldee lexicon, we again get this idea of a bottle uh, for carrying water or for wine. So we have this thought of this bottle, this empty bottle in which would be this demon. Still referring to this Jesenius lexicon further along in the article, it says, Ventriloquist, and correctly, because ventriloquists amongst the ancients commonly abused this art of inward speaking for magical purposes, how then could it be that the same Hebrew word could express a bottle and a ventriloquist? Apparently, from the magician, when possessed with the demon, being as it were a bottle or vessel, and sheath of this python, see Acts 16, verse 16, which refers to the damsel possessed with a spirit of divination who brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. Not surprisingly, the scriptures are abundantly clear that a person that fell into this category of having a familiar spirit, a, a necromancer or a wizard was an abomination to the Lord. Deuteronomy 18, verse 10, There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch. In verse 11, Or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. Leviticus 19, verse 26, Ye shall not eat anything with the blood, neither shall ye use enchantment, nor observe times. Leviticus 20, verse 6, And the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits, and after wizards to go a-whoring after them, I will even set my face against that soul, that living person, and will cut him off from among his people. Leviticus 19, verse 31, Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God, which means at the end there, signed by God himself. Jeremiah 27, verse 9, Therefore hearken not to your prophets, nor to your diviners, nor to your dreamers, nor to your enchanters, nor to your sorcerers, which speak unto you, saying, Ye shall not serve the king of Babylon. And we won't read the rest of the story in that chapter. And then going back to Exodus 22, verse 18, Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. 1 Samuel 28, verse 3 tells us, Saul had put away those that had familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. The law actually says in Leviticus 20, verse 27, A man also or woman that hath a familiar spirit or that is a wizard shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. If the meaning of 1 Samuel 28 verse 3 is to be understood that Saul drove these people out of the land, as good as that was, it was not in fact in keeping with the law of God which required that these people be put to death by stoning them. I'm not going to make an issue out of this point, as it could be that this is in fact what Saul did. However, it sounds like he may have just merely driven them out of the land, and if this is the case, he was not obedient to the law of God. Had he actually put all of them to death, there would have been none left to inquire of. Now, the fact that Saul went to this witch at Endor was itself a fatal snare to him, as we are going to go on and see. Coming back to the story itself again, the problem Saul is facing is that the Philistines have set themselves up against Israel. Saul is afraid and God has rejected him and is not speaking to him. In verse 6, And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him, not neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. 
Then said Saul unto his servants, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. And Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment, and he went, and two men with him, and they came to the woman by night, and he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit, and bring him up, whom I shall name unto thee. Again, let's remind ourselves of the law of God. Leviticus 19, verse 31, We are not to regard them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. Leviticus 20, verse 6, And the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits, and after wizards, to go a-whoring after them, I will even, even set my face against that soul, and will cut him off from among his people. There is the death penalty for doing this. And so we can clearly see that Saul is walking totally contrary to this. He is doing the exact opposite of God's clearly stated commandments. And in this we can see that Saul is actually contributing to his own unhappy ending. And to make the matter crystal clear, in 1 Chronicles 10 verse 13 it says, Saul died for his transgression which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord which he kept not, and also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it. It was a fatal error of judgment when Saul went to the witch at Endor. In relation to all of this, it is of interest to note something that Samuel said to Saul earlier in the piece, back in 1 Samuel 15, verse 22, where we read, And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Is it not remarkable that witchcraft, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and witchcraft played a significant role in the death of Saul? He should never have gone to the witch at Endor and committed this abomination unto the Lord. Verse 8 we read, And Saul disguised himself, and put on other raiment, and he went, and two men with him, and they came to the woman by night, and he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit, and bring me him up, whom I shall name unto thee. Verse 9, And the woman said unto him, Behold, thou knowest what Saul hath done, how he hath cut off those that have familiar spirits, and the wizards, out of the land, wherefore then layest thou a snare for my life, to cause me to die? And Saul swear to her by the Lord. And it's often the case, isn't it? We are intent on sinning, but we want to bring the Lord on for the ride to somehow ease our conscience. And so Saul swears to the witch by the Lord, saying no punishment shall come to her, and he had no authority whatsoever to make such a pledge. But such are the ways of man when he walks according to the flesh. And Saul swear to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord liveth, there shall no punishment happen to thee for this thing. And in verse 11, Then said the woman, Whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, Bring me up Samuel. It is important not to forget verse 6, which has told us that when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. And among Old Testament prophets, Samuel is the big name. It presents a clear problem, in my opinion, to hold to a strong view that Samuel is now to be raised from the dead, was raised from the dead, to conduct an interview with Saul by means of a witch who is possessed of a demon and who should have been put to death. It is far more likely that what transpired was a demonic manifestation masquerading as Samuel. In verse 12, And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice, 
And the woman spake to Saul, saying, Why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul. And the king said unto her, Be not afraid, for what sawest thou? And the woman said unto Saul, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. The witch is somewhat shocked and afraid, and I don't think that it's clear what she is shocked and afraid of exactly. It could be the appearance of what looks to be Samuel, or it could be that she now understands that the man standing in front of her is Saul, and after all, Saul put all the witches and the wizards out of the land. And I think that this is likely. And so Saul moves to assure her that she does not need to be afraid. But whatever the case is, Saul is interested to hear about what the witch saw. And he is told that, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. Now, figuring what the witch saw was indeed as she described, then one would have to conclude that she was seeing demons because concerning that which is of God, we read in James 1 verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights. Amen. Concerning this situation, however, there is no light and plenty of darkness. Concerning this, we further note that in verses 8, 11, 14 and 15, Five times we are dealing with that which is to be brought up. So for those who hold to the view that this was indeed the spirit of Samuel, who had died and gone to heaven and was now being brought back, on each and every occasion in the scriptures here, there's simply no reference to bringing Samuel down from heaven to speak with Saul. The whole notion of one soul going to heaven immediately after one dies just doesn't hold water, not even in a slightly unusual story as this one is. If this is Samuel indeed, all this would do is simply prove that when he had died, he went to the grave and was not in heaven, hence he came up and did not come down. When the statement is made, why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? simply means, why did you disturb me? Why did you awaken me? In verse 14, And he said unto her, What form is he of? And she said, An old man cometh up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel, and he stooped with his face to the ground, and bowed himself. Carefully note that in verse 13, the witch tells Saul what she saw, and that was, God's ascending out of the earth. But in verse 14, Saul goes on and says, What form is he of? The witch then describes an old man with a mantle, which, by the way, would have been an easy description to use of one who was so well known. And then from this, Saul perceives that Samuel has come up. The description of what is going on in verses 13 and 14 is confusing. Something is getting lost in the translation going from verses 13 to 14, and what is clear is that it is unclear. And from all of this, Saul, who has not actually seen anything for himself, perceives that Saul has come up from the grave. So. Is it possible that Saul was deceived? He was very much afraid. He was desperate at wit's end. And God was not speaking to him. No, not even by the prophets. And now he is consulting with a witch who has a familiar spirit. On the balance of the facts that we have before us here, it is most likely and I believe that Saul is being deceived and is being played by the witch with the familiar spirit. Bearing in mind that the witch has every motive to deceive Saul. After all, Saul was no friend of hers and was also responsible for driving out all of her fellow witches and wizards, driving them out of the land. Now Saul was before her begging for help and he's at wit's end. 
Whatever we may ultimately think about the story, it is quite reasonable to believe that Saul is being deceived. Verse 15, And Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? And Saul answered, I am sore distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God is departed from me, and answereth me no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I have called thee, that thou may, mayest make known unto me what I shall do. Then said Samuel, Wherefore then dost thou ask of me, seeing the Lord is departed from thee, and is become thine enemy? Verse 16, we hear that the Lord has departed from him and is become his enemy. And then in verse 19, the death sentence is pronounced upon Saul and his sons. And also there would be a disaster for Israel. So this is a message of evil and bad tidings spoken to Saul. Now let's remember a few things with all of this. Firstly, Saul hasn't actually seen anything for himself. Secondly, this is a confusing vision described in verses 13 and 14. Thirdly, based on this, Saul perceives that Samuel has come up from the dead. So we are dealing with Saul's perception of things. And fourthly, Samuel is apparently speaking to Saul. And on this point, we must not forget what we learned earlier, that a person with a familiar spirit, that has a demon, was also a ventriloquist, and if we accept that this witch was indeed possessed of a demon, then doubtless, with the aid of this, she would have been an excellent ventriloquist to aid her in her dark arts. Also, it's night time, so obviously it's dark, and with the witch throwing her voice, being skilled at throwing her voice, Saul perceives that he is speaking to Samuel. The entire situation definitely leans itself very much in favour of Saul being tricked by this witch. In addition with all of this, we must not forget that the Bible tells us that the dead know not anything. Ecclesiastes 9 verse 5, For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. We have been told twice already that Samuel is dead, and thus it's not possible for him to engage in any discussion whatsoever unless he was physically raised from the grave with his body. And this did not occur in 1 Samuel chapter 28, and so this rules out the possibility that Samuel himself was conversing with Saul. Also in the same vein, but this time dealing with the child that was born of David's adultery with Bathsheba, we know that that child died, and concerning this, King David said in 2 Samuel 12, verse 23, But now he is dead, wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. And this further confirms that the dead cannot come back to the land of the living and have a few discussions. That is reserved for the day of resurrection, and that will be a bodily resurrection. Now, please don't take what I've just said out of context. Of course, there are examples in both the Old Testament and New Testaments of persons being bodily raised from the dead. And these people obviously died again later on. The point being made is that there's no communication whatsoever with the dead. And when it comes to those people like the witch at Endor dealing with the dead, they are dealing with demons masquerading as dead people. That is what their dark art is all about. Elsewhere in the Bible, we find another king of Israel walking in open rebellion against God, being deceived by a lying spirit coming through the mouth of false prophets. And this is found in 1 Kings chapter 22, which deals with an alliance between King Ahab of Israel and King Jeroboam of Judah. And in that chapter, in verse 21, we read, And there came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? And he said, I will go forth, and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, Thou shalt persuade him, and prevail also, go forth and do so. Now therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets, 
and the Lord hath spoken evil concerning thee. As regards the prophetic aspect of the word that was spoken to Saul, we read in 1 Samuel 28 verse 19, Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with thee into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow shalt thou and thy sons be with me. The Lord shall also deliver the host of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. Firstly, we may, we may note this. It was a statement that Saul was going to die and go to the grave. Nothing is said of his soul going to life in heaven or in hell. Once again, the widespread view of the immortal soul holds no water. Secondly, given the predicament Saul was in, this was the most likely outcome. In other words, one did not have to, pos to possess the supernatural, Holy Ghost-inspired insight of a true prophet of God to see the handwriting on the wall. And thirdly, it was said that Saul would die tomorrow. But as we move from chapter 28 to chapter 29 and then to 30, it appears that several days have passed. We read in 1 Samuel 30 verse 1, And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day, and David smote them in verse 17, And David smote them from the twilight even unto the evening of the next day, and there escaped not a man of them, save four hundred young men, which rode upon camels and fled. Having read that, we then come to chapter 31, and it is there that we find the record of Saul's death. And we read in 1 Samuel 31 verse 1, Now the Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines, and fell down slain in Mount Gilboa. Verse 3. And the battle went sore against Saul, and the archers hit him, and he was sore wounded of the archers. Then said Saul unto his armour-bearer, Draw thy sword, and thrust me through therewith, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through, and abuse me. But his armour-bearer would not, for he was sore afraid. Therefore Saul took a sword, and fell upon it. And when his armour-bearer saw that Saul was dead, he fell likewise upon his sword, and died with him. From this it appears that Saul died a few days later, and not strictly tomorrow, as was prophesied. Perhaps this will be a case of near enough is good enough for some. Whatever the case is, I am not going to take a strong line on this particular point, because it is possible that the unfolding of what occurred in chapters 29, 30 and 31 may not have been set forth in a strict chronological order. However, it looks to me that it is simply impossible to prove the matter one way or the other, and therefore, taken together with everything else that we have been looking at, this should at least raise a question in our minds. Moreover, from the actual prophecy, it is directly implied that the cause of Saul's death would be that he, together with Israel, would be delivered into the hands of the Philistines. But, as we read chapter 31, we see that the cause of death was not the Philistines themselves, was not the Philistine archers, but the fact that he committed suicide and fell upon his own sword. And in so doing, it was he that brought about the fulfillment of that aspect of the prophecy. Thus, it was a self-fulfilling prophecy, which term means a belief or expectation that an individual holds about a future event that manifests itself because the individual holds it. Having considered this, let's now consider the opposite view that the prophecy was true indeed in every aspect. Does this in and of itself have to mean that it was from God, that it was from the prophet of God, Samuel? The Samuel that spoke to Saul spoke words of truth. But this is not necessarily a basis to then accept that this must be the real Samuel, the real prophet of God speaking. The demon-possessed damsel in Acts 16 spoke words of truth also. We read in Acts 16, verse 16, And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, that's Paul and the company that was with him, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. 
The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High, which show unto us the way of salvation. The words that this damsel spoke were absolutely true. Nonetheless, the intention was not to lead anyone to Christ, but to drive them from him. If you read the story a little further, you will see that this damsel drove Paul and those that were with him completely up the wall. And after several days, Paul commanded the demon to come out of her, and she was delivered that same hour. And this is simply a wonderful thing indeed. Praise the Lord. From this, we can see the fact that while words of truth, either in part or in whole, were spoken to Saul, it clearly does not mean that we can safely conclude from this that Saul is actually in communication with the dead Samuel. In concluding this examination of 1 Samuel chapter 28, we can clearly see that those who hold to the view that this chapter is teaching that there is a separate soul spirit that continues on after death and that is floating around somewhere and can, and can be communicated with, such people are swimming against the current which is flowing in the opposite direction, that is, the current of Scripture, the teaching from the Word of God. There are enormous obstacles to overcome to hold to the view that Saul was in fact in communication with the dead Samuel. If Samuel had been raised bodily by God, then all would have been well enough. But we are dealing with a witch, with a familiar spirit, who is a ventriloquist, and we are also dealing with all of the scriptural prohibitions about such people and dealing with such people. Saul was in the ideal situation to be deceived by a, a lying spirit, as was King Ahab of Israel, and ultimately Saul fulfilled the prophecy himself by taking his own life, and so the story is a complete tragedy. Once again, it was a fatal error of judgment that night that Saul went to the witch at Endor, and this played a significant role in his death. 1 Chronicles 10 verse 13, Saul died for his transgression which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord which he kept not, and also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it. I am sure that as Christians, none in their right mind would want any part of this kind of wickedness. Let us also be aware that many corruptions and false teachings have crept into Christianity down through, well, most of the last 2,000 years, primarily thanks to the papacy and the Roman Catholic Church, which is the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Many of these things have been carried over into Protestantism and are still with us to this very day and are yet to be rooted out. One of these things is the pagan belief of an immortal soul. Let each one of us always be prepared to examine ourselves, the beliefs that we hold dearly. Let's question them. Let's make sure that they are right. And we need to be prepared to repent and change our ways if need be. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 21 Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Amen. Before I end this series, I'm going to mention something else in connection with the death of Saul. As we know from 1 Samuel chapter 31, while in battle, Saul had been wounded by the Philistine archers, but it was not a fatal wound, and so he took his own life to finish the job off. Concerning these last moments, we read about this again in 2 Samuel chapter 1 verse 9. The story being told here is being relayed by an Amalekite, and I'm not going to look at that aspect of things, but rather focus in on what Saul said. And so we read in 2 Samuel 1 verse 9, He said unto me, again, this is Saul saying to the Amalekite, Stand, I pray thee, upon me, and slay me, for anguish is come upon me, because my life is yet whole in me. Saul says, my life is yet whole in me. 
to paraphrase the matter, Saul is saying he's not about to die of his injuries and he wants to be helped along his way. This is what he told the armor bearer back in 1 Samuel chapter 31, but this Amalekite is simply repeating the story as though it was told to him. These words in English, my life, is Strong's number H5315, and it is the Hebrew word that is pronounced something like nefesh. As you can see here, the word is used prolifically in the Old Testament, and the top three translations of nefesh are soul, 475 times, life, 117 times, as we have it here in this verse, and person, 29 times. To develop this a little further, we read in Genesis 1 verse 30, And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life. The word life there is the same Hebrew word nephesh. Then we go to Genesis 2 verse 7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. The word soul there is the same Hebrew word nephesh. It's life in Genesis 1 verse 30, and in Genesis 2 verse 7 it is the word soul. The animal has nephesh and the man has nephesh. They both have been given life. And specifically of the man, it says here, man became a living soul, which means he became a living person. Praise the Lord. This life or soul is not presented to us in the Bible as a kind of a separate spirit entity, as is so often believed and taught. Now, what happens when an animal or a man dies? Simply, quite simply, they lose their life and the result is death. In this sense, it is the reversal of creation and specifically for the man, and it is the man that we are interested in, the scriptures tell us the spirit returns to the Lord who gave it and the body goes to the ground and becomes dust and in so doing, there is simply no life any longer. So there is no soul because the soul is the living man. Still further, Exodus 4 verse 19, For all the men are dead which sought thy life. Exodus 21 verse 23, Then thou shalt give life for life. Exodus 21 verse 30, He shall give for the ransom of his life whatsoever is laid upon him. This word life is all the same Hebrew word nephesh. Concerning Rachel, as she was giving birth to Benjamin, we read in Genesis 35, verse 18, And it came to pass, as her soul was in departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni, but his father called him Benjamin. The word soul used here is the same Hebrew word nephesh that we have been looking at. It is argued that this verse proves that at death the soul as a separate spirit entity of some kind departs. The reasoning seems to be that as it says the soul is departing, it must be going somewhere and that has to mean either to heaven or to hell. However, this same verse actually provides the meaning for what is being said. For it says, and it came to pass as her soul was in departing, then it explains it in brackets by saying, for she died. The meaning of her soul was in departing simply means she died. Now, who wants to add to or take away from the word of God? We need to be very careful indeed. Coming back to Saul, although wounded, he was not wounded unto death. I'm sorry to borrow a phrase from the book of Revelation, but we're talking about something a little bit different here. He was not wounded unto death, for he was not about to die, for his nephesh, or his life, remained wholly in him. This is quite unlike Rachel, whose soul, or nephesh, was departing, meaning life was going out of her because she was dying. Saul had to take his own life, 
and therefore his nephesh departed from him when he fell upon his own sword. From these things, we can clearly see that humans do not have souls, but rather we are souls. And I'm going to say amen to that. Amen. And with all of that, I'm now going to end part seven. I hope that this entire series has been a blessing and a help to you. It certainly has been a joy for me to have put this together. Goodbye, until next time.